Just as a quick introduction, um, Ramon studied physics at the University of Seville. He and it earned his PhD in quantum physics. Now he's a professor at the same university where, among other things, he studies cryobiology and cryobiotech. And his talk will be about the problems and solutions for organ cryopreservation. Ramon, please take it from here. And Ramon, quick thing, you need to share your screen. There should be a large um, green button um, on the bottom of the stream where it says share screen. Do you see the button? Just click that button and then um, you should be able to... That looks already, that starts to look correct. In order to achieve the cryopreservation of an organ, you need three things. You need a uniform loading of the cryoprotectant inside it. You need a uniform cooling of your organ and you need a uniform warming. Besides, there are two sets of boundary conditions that must be fulfilled. One is uh, relative to the concentration of cryoprotectant. It should be high enough me? to avoid the formation of ice. And, uh, but of course, low enough to, to avoid the toxicity. And the second is relative to the cooling and warming rate that usually needs to be beyond 13 threshold. To summarize, it is what engineers call a problem of, of heat and mass transfer. In order to overcome this problem, we have explored a set of fields that I will talk about. They are X-rays, magnetological fluids, ultrasounds, time varying electric fields and mathematical modeling. The reason for starting this research in X-rays came from a couple of papers uh, that I read. After reading that, I found that uh, an efficient method for, for measuring the amount of sky protection during cooling was mandatory. One paper was from uh, Greg Fahey on rabbit kidneys and the other from uh, David Peck on articular cartilage. At that time, there were not uh, many works uh, on, uh, on exploring this uh, measuring of the cryoprotectant. Maybe the closest was one by Barry Fuller by using magnetic resonance MRI. However, soon I realized that the temporal and spatial precision was uh, not uh, enough for that. And besides that, uh, probably the cost of the technology was uh, high. So. The first thing that we did was to explore uh, bioimpedance. Here uh, you have a mesenchymal stem cell growing in rapid release. So by putting a set of electrodes around outside and by looking what's happening in the boundaries, you try to figure out what's happening inside. Uh, however, the efficiency of, of this technique is not uh, very high, although uh, probably it is very, very cheap. So there were not many places to look at. Uh, the remaining one was uh, ultrasound, but probably was not a good idea. So finally, we end up with uh, the last possibility that, that was X-rays. When you look at X-rays, there are three uh, reasons why the beam is attenuated. One is the Rayleigh scattering, the other is the Compton scattering, and finally you have the photoelectric absorption. In the case of medical devices, uh, they work at high energies here, so the Compton scattering is uh, relevant, is uh, dominant, and the attenuation in that case is proportional to the density, and that is why they can distinguish uh, different parts in the, in the body, because different density. However, when you go to lower and lower energies, as you can see here, the photoelectric uh, absorption becomes uh, uh, dominant. So, because the photoelectric absorption goes with the fifth power of the atomic number, in the case of the DMSO, because the sulfur atoms has an atomic number of 35, that the, in the fifth power makes something like a billion, a mixed attenuation is a bigger times higher than that of the hydrogen. So with this idea in mind, we went to the X-ray device and we put glycerol, ethylene glycol, dimeso, propylene diol, and water. And as you can see here, the result uh, was what we foresaw, foresaw. That was that the, the signal for the DMSO should be evident. We test how scalable this was this technique and of course it was working in dependos, it was working in mm, 20 ml caps. 
and uh, not only for detecting the, the DMSO but also for detecting the presence of ice that is important ice is where the DMSO is not so here you have a uh, an ice cube floating in 50% uh, DMSO and here you have something like 8 droplets of uh, frozen water of 1 microliter inside a vitrified uh, kidney. So uh, the, the first application of this was of course in the field of uh, slow freezing in cryovials, so it's very common. Uh, here you have a, a, a piece of ovarian tissue in the typical slow freezing and you can see very nice the very nice patterns of the dendrites growing and by doing that you can control the, the slow freezing process. Uh, not only that but uh, we understood why there is a so big dispersion in the results among different centers and the reason is that these patterns depends the, the form the, uh, the structure depends critically on many parameters, the amount of seeding points that you are using, the amount of liquid that you put in your cryovial, the position of, of, of your tissue, uh, of course on, on the cooling rate or also on the seeding temperature. So uh, this dependence made that um, uh, only uh, the same hands can reproduce exactly the same patterns. So uh, only a very well uh, trained people can can do uh, in a fishing way this ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Um, when when looking at that, uh, this technique is uh, was not relevant only for the cooling. Um, Ramon, quick thing, could you could you speak up a bit? Before the yes, can you hear me? And also yeah, could you speak a bit louder? Cryopreservation in this case was it is it is the maximum. In that, okay, in that can you? Yeah, okay, if you can't, then it's fine. Put the, the loudspeaker of your computer higher. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. After the washing, but before the transplant or not, you do not want to transplant your samples with the MSO inside. With this, uh, the, the, the last application of this technology was for the detection of uh, fractures. Here you have a vitrified kidney, and here you have a kidney that uh, you put directly in liquid nitrogen without any care, so you can detect a bunch of fractures uh, inside it. With these ideas in mind, uh, we started to do what we wanted, that, that is to follow the approach of Farrant, but um, by using organs. Let me remember quite uh, fast uh, what he did. He put uh, quite uh, caps of uh, increasing concentrations of cryoprotectant at a lower and lower temperature. And with a piece of, of, of uh, uterus, or rat uterus, he was uh, jumping from one cap to the other. And finally, he vitrified by following this uh, liquid curve. Here you have the what's happening in the control. This is for the slow freezing, the contractions. And these are the contractions in the in this case of this uh, stepwise um, vitrification. So we build this setup in which the important part is this uh, CT device. This is how it looks like in, in the lab. This is for cooling. This is uh, dry nitrogen for avoiding condensation. This is the pump for PDS. This is the pump for the DMSO. This is the computer for controlling the, the pumps and the system. And uh, in this setup, we soon realized that there was a missing piece, a missing part, that uh, were the hands of a, a surgeon in order to have an efficient way of uh, taking off the organs from, from the animal and making the transplant. So we had to stop that research. Did we find uh, so someone able to do this uh, very important part, that is the, the surgery. However, uh, we were able, in fact, to, to follow the Fanta, uh, the Farrant approach, but uh, for ovarian tissue instead of the rat uterus. Who it was a nice collaboration with uh, General Electric, with Peter Kilbride and John Morris, and for with Christiane Morin for the ov for the ovarian tissue. We modified one of these uh, Stirling motors. We put here a robotic arm, and we can jump from one cup to the other in a controlled way. So all this assisted with the CD produced this uh, vitrification of the um, of the of the tissue. Uh, the next uh, topic that we explore were the use of magnetological fluids. These are ferrofluids. 
Uh, imagine that you put one fluid in one of these syringes and you start to push, say, so you can move very easily the fluid from one from one syringe to the to the other one. However, as soon as you put an external magnetic field, the liquid becomes stuck, becomes uh, solid. The viscosity rises orders of magnitude. Uh, this liquid is sold by this company who make this special uh, damper. The idea was to put the, the, the liquid inside an organ and to, to control the viscosity by an external magnetic field. And it's similar in certain sense to what Peter Kilbride wants to do with a non-Newtonian fluid, but in this case he's trying to control the viscosity with an external sudden pressure. However, when we put this liquid inside uh, an organ, we try a few times, uh, although the, 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 the loading was not that difficult, the washing process was, for us, almost really impossible. It was really challenging to wash the organ, uh, to wash the organ out of these um, uh, fluid or, or magnetic particles. The thing is that I have to give a thesis to these poor students, so we produce this uh, rewarming of samples with uh, microwave radiation by means of uh, magnetological fluids for its application in cryopreservation. And the thing is that uh, there are two reasons why these uh, ferrofluids uh, becomes very hot when you put in an alternating electric and magnetic field, that is the case of a uh, microwave. There are two reasons associated with the electric fields and there are two reasons associated with the magnetic field. So if you put uh, this uh, inside the microwave oven, this is the, the warming rate that you have uh, when you uh, are working without this uh, ferrofluid and this is the warming rate that you have when you are working with the ferrofluid. So in the case of uh, cryovials or ependos, the washing was not, not that difficult as you can see. So maybe it has some applications in the case of uh, slow freezing in, in cryovials. Now uh, the work of uh, John Bischoff uh, by by using this fluid but controlling uh, the the magnetic field with an external coil is doing a much much uh, better uh, game, and uh, I'm quite sure that they are in the in the right uh, way in the right path for for rewarming uh, those uh, samples the samples by using this uh, control, by this external magnetic field. The next thing that we were exploring, well, at the same time, in fact, were, were the, uh, the ultrasound, uh, the rationale fro for this came from a couple of papers that, after that were surprising. They are uh, a bit old, but uh, the results were amazing. Uh, they claim that uh, treating something like one liter of water uh, and leaving the water with ultrasounds and leaving the water uh, on, on, on a shelf after one month, the water was very difficult to freeze. Uh, that result was surprising. More surprising was the fact that after those uh, uh, papers, uh, you cannot find anything in the literature. We make a very deep uh, searching and there was nothing. And uh, uh, also a, a characteristic of these works is that they only give some quantitative information. They don't. They do not give any qualitative information. Only they tell about the 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 frequency of the ultrasound, but they don't give information about the power or about the kind of water they were using, or for example about the walls of the container that they were using. Nothing at all. So we decided to do it in a more controllable way and see what's happening. So we built this setup. This is a flux of water. We put here a layer of pelter plates and a second layer of pelter plates, but playing the role of thermocouple. Here you put the cup, the the, the droplets uh, of, of water. This is the ultrasound transducer, uh, with the hope that we the, the the droplets with these ultrasounds. This is how it looks like, uh, and here you have another view. And this is the last view with the ultrasound uh, device here. So when the temperature uh, starts to, to, to low, each time a um, uh, water droplet freeze release the latent heat, and you can detect this uh, release of the latent heat, I mean the, 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 the frozen of the, of the droplets by, by, by looking at what's happening at the, at the Peltier plates uh, on top. Uh, so after doing uh, something like uh, tens of thousands of droplets. With this device, you can have 
a bunch of uh, statistics, we couldn't find any effect. So uh, this explains part of the story, why there were not uh, papers after those in the, in the 47, uh, 48. And it is because uh, maybe uh, for us, uh, in this very controllable way, we, uh, there was no effect. So anyway, we, we were quite uh, sure that uh, this author saw something and thinking what could be, we end up with a very plausible conclusion. What they were doing with the ultrasounds were degasifying the water, just repeating with the ultrasound you remove the gas, so you remove the nucleation sites uh, in the case of uh, small nucleation sites for the for the for the for the eyes. We found that in, in a different uh, in a different uh, parallel work that was working with uh, degasification by using a vacuum pump. In that case, by by using this degasification in the vacuum by, by the vacuum pump with the aim, with the goal of avoiding uh, fractures, uh, we found that uh, this degasification was very effective in avoiding the fractures and the same uh, degasification uh, uh, could be done by using those ultrasound. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, this exploration of the ultrasounds uh, can have a second application that is for the warming of, uh, of, the, of the organs. Uh, this paper is about to be published in, it is in press in ultrasonics and here you have uh, an ovary of this size and we are still making these uh, simulations so uh, we pass from minus 140 to minus 20 degrees in a very uniform and quick enough way here you have this uniform region of warming so you can see what's happening in the x-axis, in the s in the y-axis, and in the z-axis, and you can see that the, the that, that, that the warming is very uniform. The next thing I would like to talk about is time varying electric field uh, for cooling. Uh, this technology, as it is now, it can be applied only for gas, but uh, maybe someone find uh, sometime a possibility to doing it for solids or for for liquids. Uh, the idea is the following, uh, imagine you have a bunch of uh, water molecules in, s in gas state in a container, they are dipoles, and you suddenly open one of the walls, so uh, at the end of the day um, they, they start escaping and the, the, the fastest will go in the front and the slower will go in the, in the rear. So the dispersion in these uh, velocities gives you, by following this uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, statistic, gives you this dispersion, this width, gives you an idea of the temperature of this uh, thermal link. So now uh, if you put a couple of uh, metallic plates in between, nothing happens, and nothing happens also if you put an electric field because the molecules are neutral, although they are dipoles, but there are some boundary effects here because here you have a zero field, so there is an inward force due to this uh, gradient of the electric field uh, that is proportional to the dipole moment of the water molecules. So uh, if you uh, apply a higher force to the molecules that are in the front and uh, a lower force to the molecules that are in the back, just by reducing the electric field inside at the same time that the molecules are escaping, then at the end of the day, all the molecules will have almost the same velocity. And in that uh, case, you have reduced the width of your, of your Gaussian, and you have cooled your, your beam. So uh, we made uh, all these uh, mechanical calculation for computing the static effect in the case of uh, water molecules, something like a mole of molecules passing from room temperature to uh, 55 Kelvin. And this cooling passing from this peak velocity to this peak velocity happens in something like one millisecond. So the cooling is really fast. However, as I said, for the moment it's only applicable to gas uh, states, maybe by think because maybe mainly mainly because you need this correlation between the field of positions and the field of velocity in order to apply the, the right electric field 
thanks to each molecule and maybe thinking in forces like uh, Coriolis forces or magnetic forces that depends on the velocity you can have this correlation between this electric this uh, position and velocity field Finally, I would like to stress the role of the mathematical models, not only for the slow freezing, but also for vitrification. In the case of slow freezing, what we did was exploring not only the typical linear profile, but also quadratic or exponential profiles. As you can see, there are differences in the degree of supercooling, depending mainly uh, on, the, on the cooling rate, uh, higher for intermediate cooling rates. And also exploring non-ideal solution models because uh, sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte, so deviation for the ideal case of Peter Maxer are expected. So this deviation can be up to 18 percent depending on the cooling rate, but also on the temperature. And for in the case of vitrification of human oocytes and embryos, what we did was. Uh, is uh, looking at these 10 minutes that the sample should remain in the equilibration solution. So uh, we realized that uh, in the first 30 seconds, up to 90% of, of the cryoprotectant has already entered, so the rest of the time uh, probably was producing some, some damage mainly. So it was enough uh, with one minute, and this uh, model have the feedback from the experiment. So we have to review all these uh, aspects and I have to give my thanks to my students and of course to my collaborators now friends that I have met in this uh, journey. Thank you very much and congratulations again for the organization of this very interesting uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Ramon, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, due to the Thank time, you. we Thank will you. only have time for, for one question. Um, the question is, what experiments are planned for the future? Like in a one-year or three-year horizon, what are you doing next? In this uh, Thank you very much and congratulations. Well, we hope to go to organs. As I said, that is a missing part in, in our setup. Uh, we need uh, the help of a surgeon. So as soon as we find someone able to take the organ off the animal and to, to, to transplant them, we will start with uh, probably kidneys, that is the goal, kidneys and hearts. Perfect, thank you so much. For more thank questions, you. as I mentioned in the introduction, we will have a dedicated Q&A and panel session at the very end of the conference. And Ramon, hopefully we can welcome you there again to, uh, to answer more questions. For now, sure. thanks a lot.